The dogs in the Delta Flyer Jr. and singing along to some opera, much to the distress of Janeway. Maybe if he had his own quarters, he could practice there instead. She gives up on sleep and replicates some coffee, and just in time for them to fly through a wibbly of unknown origin and have a bit of shaking. We'll leave the dog to show off his piloting skills while we remind ourselves that Ensign Conspicuous exists. Will he be the next into the meat grinder of incidental character deaths? Possibly, if the sparks are any indication. Paris calls Balana away to the shuttle bay for an emergency. It's a pretense, of course, the summons a way of making sure she gets a break and some food. Perhaps with Neelix gone, people have started to rediscover that eating can be enjoyable. She can't spare the time, though, even for the promise of fried chicken, and Paris is once again left holding his meat. To the bridge, where Kim's receiving a message from the Delta Flyer Jr. through rather unorthodox means, the normal phone having been damaged. Janeway says they're both fine, though I note she's the one flying now, but says she wants to see Chakotay as soon as she gets back. Clearly something kicked off. The thing in question was meeting a new species, and a particularly powerful one from Janeway's recap. They could mop the floor with us, and that's a bit of a problem. See, they don't like warp drives. In fact, they don't allow them in their space. Their very big space. Their very big space that we've already been in for weeks. The punishment is Voyager's destruction by their cloaked fleet, but she's managed to talk them down to making us settle on a planet in their space. Smells like bullshit to me, so I'm calling it now. That's not Janeway. The smell gets worse when she resists ideas from Chakotay for how to escape, and says she wants to keep all of this from the crew. Chakotay looks about as convinced as I am when he leaves. The suspicion grows further when she talks to Balana about ejecting the warp core and towing it behind the Delta Flyer Jr., and without shutting it down from the sounds of things. Word gets back to Chakotay, and he queries it with Janeway. She's evasive, not least of which because she seems to be talking to herself before claiming illness and going to her quarters. Sounds like we need more of the story, but the Doc can't help. He teleports over when Chakotay arrives at sickbay and finds it empty, which is odd enough to be noteworthy. Anywho, he says he was disabled when Janeway met those new aliens and doesn't know anything. He checked her over after they'd interrogated her and left, but found no issues. Maybe it's time to double-check. To Astrometrics, where Chakotay wants to know if lots of cloaked ships would leave any clues. There'd be lots of subspace wibblies, according to Seven, and she doesn't mention having seen any, though that could be because she wasn't looking. Speak of the dickheads, there's a call from the aliens Janeway mentioned, and she said she wasn't to be disturbed, so Chakotay takes it. The lad on the other end wants to know why we've not dropped our warp gubbins yet like we agreed, suggesting Janeway's mention of spitting it out at the planet we're going to settle on might not be entirely above board. Either way, we've got ten hours before he says he'll fuck us up. Chakotay leaves Seven to try and track down where the call came from with Kim while he checks on the dock. All's well with Janeway, he says, so let's have another chat. There's something odd, though. No, not the fact that he rings the doorbell with his middle finger, but rather Janeway not being here. She instead arrives just as he's about to ask the computer to locate her. In we go, where she continues being evasive. Chakotay's had enough, though, and trips her up by referencing something he'd fabricated, a trick the real Janeway would have seen through. So much for subterfuge, let's switch to sleepy time juice instead. We're in sick bay, and after teleporting Chakotay onto a morgue slab and nicking his comm badge, Janeway goes into the doc's office. Or, more accurately, the doc goes into the doc's office. He's cosplaying as Janeway, and the reason becomes apparent after making a demand to the voices in his head that he be allowed to see her. Now here's a surprise. It's the pound shops on Tarans, they of stealth and subterfuge, who invested all of their character creation points into spying. They've got Janeway, but that doesn't prevent her from trying to order the Doctor to stop what he's doing in planning to eject the warp core. Not quite sure why, as they've got a spare according to the schematics I've seen, but maybe that wasn't true until after this was filmed. The attempt fails anyway, and he refuses to follow the order, an unintended consequence of a hardwired do-no-harm rule, perhaps. And now they want some gel packs, too, the stuff Voyager uses instead of normal circuits, and we usually only hear about when something goes wrong. The problems are starting to pile up as Tuvok's calling Chakotay, a bit of an issue, what with him being knocked out and all, so the Doc has to substitute for him as well. Much more of this, and he's going to be the only member of the crew left. While the Doc's pretending to be Chakotay, Janeway's trying to sow a little discord. 
She tells the Thumbfaces that the Doc is likely tricking them, maybe even showing a simulation through the visual feed they're tapping into, but that she'll let bygones be bygones if they release her in an escape pod. They're not convinced, possibly because they've heard about what she does to her own crew, but they can't back out now anyway as they've already lined up a buyer for the warp core. And they let slip another interesting fact. They're not part of the organisation we ran into before, instead having nicked a ship and scarpered. Perhaps we can get their own people involved in stopping them. Back to the dock on Voyager, where finding gel packs is proving to be a relatively easy job. As long as you call pretending to be Belana so you can grab some spares without suspicion easy, and meeting with Paris on the upper levels of engineering, who once again tries to force his meat into someone's mouth. The chicken is declined, but Belana Doc can't escape a kiss. Let's sidestep the very murky moral waters we're in by having the Doc change into Chakotay so he can answer a summons from Kim. He and Seven have tracked the transmission from earlier and discovered that the call was coming from inside the house. The holodeck specifically, so Kim wants to check it out and Chakotay Doc goes with him. The inevitable uncovering of the truth results in one more crew member taking a nap in the morgue and one more part for the Doc to play. At least he doesn't have to learn any complicated backstory, I guess. The Doc's new career as an impersonator might be coming to an end. Tuvok's here, and he's discovered that, as Voyager received their odd call from the Delta Flyer Junior, the Doc had connected to the computer and downloaded Janeway's appearance from a database. An attempt at providing sleepy time juice goes awry, and as Tuvok starts kabooming hollow emitters in sickbay, the Doc switches to the mobile emitter and legs it into the holodeck. Tuvok's faced with a problem when he catches up, and one that's even worse than he thought, as the Doctor isn't any of them. He's already crawling his way to engineering. Chicote Doc appears, from the door to the Jeffreys tubes by the way, so a point to whoever was tracking that, and orders everybody out. Balana's the last to leave, but is stopped on the way by a call from Paris, who says the Doc's mobile emitter is in engineering. He realises he's rumbled, so sticks her behind a force field and switches to command mode Doc so he can fart out the warp core. Chakotay would have had that power too, but I'm guessing the Doc doesn't know his codes. Dropping the warp core shuts down most of the power, of course, but let's assume the force fields holding Balana have a backup. Time for another change, and Balana Doc's off to the shuttle bay. We meet Tuvok on the way, and he's not fooled, but doesn't expect his opponent to start running along the ceiling. Balana Doc grabs Tuvok's gun in the process and poops some yellow at him. Tuvok had ordered some guards to the shuttle bay before he took his nap, but they must have been as ineffective as normal. The Doc takes the Delta Flyer Junior, grabs the warp core, and buggers off. As the Doc makes his way to the Thumbface ship, Janeway's trying to befriend one of them. He's the more technical of the two, and trying to repair odds and sods to sell them, a task considered pointless by the other who tells him as much while insulting him. Their little domestic is interrupted by the arrival of the Doc, who's here bearing gifts. The delivery goes a little off script when, instead of releasing Janeway, they just kidnap the Doc instead. The thumb face Janeway was talking to apologises and says he didn't know the boss was going to do this, but that doesn't change the end result. Voyager's slowly bringing non-critical things back online, two of them being Chakotay and Kim. The next order of business is tracking the Doc, something made impossible because he did science to his warp what's it. The return of partial power has an unexpected result. Some classical music that the Doc was listening to before Tuvok tried to bust him starts playing. Strange thing though, some of the notes are off and it's playing everywhere too. Malfunction? Maybe not, suggests Tuvok. To the meeting room, where we learn Seven has done a science to the music. That provides a number, apparently, and Paris recognises it as a warp watsit. Beeps are booped, and we find a matching watsit nearly seven light years away. Voyager's limited to sublight speed, so Tuvok and Paris are going in a shuttle. I could point out that 6.7 light years in a shuttle capable of warp 4 would take nearly a month, but nobody seems to notice, so let's ignore it for now. Maybe they're using the one that turns people into lizards. Back on the spy ship, our pound shops on Tarans have found a way to make the dock useful. Having someone that can mimic people opens up a whole universe of thieving opportunities, and they want to start by nicking the espionage database from their old bosses. Secrets can be very valuable indeed, and they're a damn sight easier to transport than warp cores. They've given the dock a suitable disguise for the job, along with a range of others just in case, but they seem to have given him more bites than he can chew. And before you rush to the comments, yes I know it's quads, but if you think I'm going to pass up a pun like that for the sake of accuracy, this must be your first visit. 
Anywho, something's gone wrong and it's caused the Doc to cycle through random appearances, much to his concern. Let's make things worse, shall we? Tuvok and Paris turn up in the shuttle. Tuvok starts pooping while Paris pops over to the Delta Flyer Jr. and steals it back. More pooping ensues, and despite some minor kabooms on the shuttle, the pound shops on Tarans are coming off worse. Boss Thumbface wants to use the warp core as a big firework and kaboom Tuvok and Paris, but the one Janeway was befriending thinks murder is a bit much. Even more pooping kabooms the force field, keeping Janeway and the dock trapped, so they join in. Some wrestling ensues, and Janeway's knocked down by a detonating console after it's hit by stray poop. Perhaps they buy them from the same shop as Starfleet. Yet more wrestling knocks the dock back into his old self, and he starts to overpower Boss Thumbface, who calls for help from his mate. His mate's had enough of all this shit, though, and twats Boss Thumbface with the gizmo he was repairing earlier. Maybe that's why all his stuff was broken in the first place. We're back on Voyager and trying to repair the Doc, who believes he's going to die. That's why he starts making confessions, such as saying he kept a list of the times he thought Janeway made bad calls. To be fair, mate, I've been keeping something similar. It's got 30 entries so far. He has more confessions for other people, including that of being in love with Seven. He bids everybody farewell, then flickers and disappears only to come back after a couple of seconds, fully repaired. Bit awkward, mate. Life on the ship has returned to normal, though the doc's not left sickbay for a week. Hardly surprising, given his outbursts when he thought he was going to cark it. Janeway comes to check on him, and also to punish him for insubordination. Whether that's for ignoring her orders about the warp core, or keeping a list of her fuck-ups, we aren't told. Happily, the punishment is a week without the mobile emitter, which he's already served by staying here, so it's done with. As such, she's free to invite him onto the holodeck, and we leave them to visit a little hollow cafe for some downtime as we fly away. You know what? Seeing the pound shops on Tyrants again genuinely cheered me up. It's the last episode before the finale, so a little callback was welcome. They've previously been played as goofballs despite their technological advantage and espionage skills, and while they do tend towards that again here, the story is just serious enough to avoid it being only comedy. I note that we could also argue they've complied with the rule of three, a suggestion I've made previously that when an alien species reaches their third appearance, we start seeing them as having more than just one trait. Fix-it guy who isn't interested in spying and just wants to repair things qualifies for that role. Some more points for the writers here too in dealing with holograms. They play with all of the stuff holographic projections can do if you stop expecting them to act like organics, jumping through windows and a desk, running up walls and along ceilings. The dock could have just floated by at high speed, of course, but that would have been less satisfying from a visual or narrative point, so let's instead suggest that holographic templates for humanoids have certain built-in standard animation parameters. There is one thing that doesn't sit quite right with me, though. Playing the dock's emotions about Seven for laughs. Now, I realise that the Doc's actions and his dealings with others are often bordering on parody, presumably intended as a reflection of how he grapples with something he's still constantly learning, but the way this was written felt like a dismissal of his worth, something that could even be considered cruel. The only comparable situation I can think of was how Kim was treated shortly after Seven joined. That interaction was troubling for other reasons, but not so much the handling of Kim. His interest was a crush at best, something only a few weeks old. Having that represented as farce isn't on the same level as something the Doc has repressed for literally years being laughed at. The Doc's affection may be just as problematic as Kim's was, something we covered in the analysis of Someone to Watch Over Me, but it would be unfair to say their investments were on the same level, and I think handling it with melodrama here does the Doc a disservice. That said, the episode was still a pretty good one, and leaves us in a strong position to enter the finale. Because this is it, folks. After 176 of these videos, and over a year and a half making this utter fucking nonsense, we finally reached the end game. End of episode. So, here's a thought. How the bloody hell are we getting off Voyager? We walk off when we dock with Deep Space Nine. Prophet's cock ring. We are not calling it Prophet's Cockring. Well, let's see what sticks before we make any decisions, eh? Sigh.
Anyway, once we dock, we just walk off the ship. Ah, now that is the problem. If we're going to arrive before we left because of time fuckery, isn't Voyager just going to disappear when we dock because we haven't left yet to be able to return? Wait. No. I mean... Oh, fuck. Yeah, that's what I thought. So what are we going to do? Think real fucking hard for the next few days, I guess. Oh, 